In Star Rail, damage over time is a unique mechanic in which enemies take bits of damage at the start of their turn. In a game where the goal is to kill enemies as quickly as possible, its one weakness is its inability to front load that damage. But with Kafka, she brought a special kit that allows her to activate that damage early, spearheading a meta centered around dot focus teams. But how exactly would she play out if she were a character in Genshin? Welcome back to another episode of Trailblazer 2 Traveler, the series where we take Star Rail characters and translate their kits into a Genshin setting. This episode, we're going to explore Kafka and her abilities to front load damage over time, or DOT as I will be calling it for the rest of the video. As always, general disclaimers, timestamps, social media links, and music credits are all down below. If you want a quick overview on how I did certain conversions on Genshin and Star Rail mechanics, you can check this video in the top right corner. For this video in particular, I want to make it very clear that it is going to get a bit confusing. Kafka's kit is focused on a mechanic that's specifically tied to Star Rail's gameplay. I not only translated her kit, but I also expanded on some core mechanics in Genshin. Do your best to pay attention, and if anything, you can always pause the video, replay sections, or ask questions in the comments. Without further ado, let's begin. First off, it's important to explain dot mechanics. Because Genshin doesn't utilize this mechanic at all, we have to improvise what it would be like in the game. The first thing is to identify what a dot ability would be. The way I viewed it is that one, it's an ability that can linger for an extended period of time, and two, it's an ability that can deal damage unconditionally. When I did my overview video, some people confused dot as being any sort of summon, but that's not really the case. Some summons, such as Albedo's, rely on a condition being met to deal damage, which would make them follow-up or coordinated attacks. In Albedo's case, the condition is hitting an enemy. Other summons can just deal damage. This can be like Yai's turrets or Farina's Salon Solitaire. The same thing goes for Marks. Nahida's Seed of Skanda is not a dot ability. It has a condition where you need to trigger a reaction on that enemy, which makes it a coordinated attack. But Charlotte's camera marks are unconditional damage, so it's dot. To recap, whether an ability is dot or follow-up is based on whether it's conditional or unconditional, not based on the form it takes. Barring some exceptions, the general rule is that if you cast your ability and take your hands off your device, if the ability still deals damage, it's dot. The aforementioned exceptions include Layla's skill, Baiju's burst, and Emily's A1 passive. While they may seem like dot abilities, they technically have conditions that trigger an attack, making them more in line with follow-ups. The second thing I want to cover is the damage typing. In Star Rail, dot is a completely separate damage type, but Genshin doesn't have this kind of mechanic. We only have normal, charged, plunging, skill, and burst damage types. So what I did was that I made dot a secondary damage type. It's possible for some abilities to have an overlap in damage types, Kind of like how we have the Night Soul alignments. For example, Mulani's bite hits are considered as normal attack damage, but its description also explains it as Night Soul aligned damage. The dot mechanic is the same way. Rosaria's burst is now considered as dot burst damage. Fischl's skill is now dot skill damage. And then Kachina's drill, at least when it's acting independently, is Night Soul aligned dot skill damage. Essentially, we're not messing with or replacing the core mechanics, we're just adding an extra layer to its foundation. So these are some of the changes I made to Genshin's combat system for the sake of making Kafka's kit fit a bit better. Now we can actually talk about what she does. Let's start by looking at Kafka's general stats. As she stands, I think her current element and weapon are already perfect for her. So, Electro Sword user. Her base stats in HSR are 1086 HP, 679 attack, and 485 defense. So in Genshin, the conversion would be 11,403 HP, 306 attack, and 703 defense. I chose to give her a 28.8% electro damage bonus, as this will be the best stat for her damage. Getting into her elemental skill, Kafka is going to do exactly what she does in Star Rail. She's going to front load dot abilities. Using her katana, she slices the enemy, marking them with a widow's bite, and then dealing AoE electro damage equal to 193% of her attack. Additionally, she will enter a Night Soul Blessing state, obtaining 60 Night Soul points. If an ally's dot ability is active, Kafka will also unleash Shock Value. Okay, so I threw out a lot of terms just now. Night Soul Blessing, Widow's Bite, Shock Value… what is all of this? Well, Natlin just came out, and with it came the Night Soul mechanics. 
I'm going to brush past it because you probably know what it is already, but also because it's not a super relevant part of her kit. I only added the Night Soul stuff for the artifact synergy because as you'll see later on, she doesn't have a lot of good sets to choose from. So don't stress out about the Night Soul stuff, it's there but it's not important. For the actual meaningful details, let's start by breaking down Widow's Bite. Kafka can only apply Widow's Bite onto a single enemy at a time. Widow's Bite is inspired by Kafka's follow-up attack where she fires her gun and shocks them. Instead of it being triggered through Ally's basic attacks or through her burst, it'll just apply with Kafka's skill. The enemy marked by this ability will take an instance of electro damage every 6 seconds, equal to 225% of Kafka's attack. Every time the Widow's Bite deals damage, Kafka will lose 20 Night Soul points. The mark will disappear when Night Soul points are gone. This mark is considered both skill damage and damage over time. It's very similar to any classic marking ability we have in Genshin. I'd say the best comparison is Charlotte's. Just cast her skill and it will do instances of damage at intervals over its duration. When Widow's Bite deals damage, it will also apply shock value. So to give you an idea of its duration, the points will run out after 18 seconds of procking. With it dealing damage every 6 seconds, you get 4 procs from Kafka's shock value, 1 from her skill cast, and then 3 more from the 6 second intervals. Next thing to explain is shock value itself. This is where things get really confusing, so stick with me, okay? When shock value is triggered, it will search for all present dot abilities in the field and deal an instance of damage equal to 71% of their original multipliers. Instances of shock value will match the talent's element, but will only be considered as damage over time. Shock value cannot crit, nor can it apply elements. This damage can only gain bonuses from the corresponding character's own stat bonuses, elemental damage bonuses, universal damage bonuses, and any of their own passive bonuses. Stat bonuses fall in line on like attack, HP, defense, or EM buffs. So Bennett can contribute to shock value bonuses as long as the original talent scales on attack. Elemental damage bonuses are right there in the name. And buffs like that can include Katsuwa's A4 or artifacts and weapons that can buff specific elements. Additive elemental buffs from characters will also work. In this case, Shenhe and Faruzan can provide a base damage bonus to any shock value matching their element. I want to mention that when shock value hits, it will count as one giant hit per damage source. So for example, Shenhe grants her team 5 to 7 icy quills. The shock value will still be owned by the original character, but fortunately it only counts as one stack being consumed per hit instead of the entire bunch. Universal damage bonuses just mean any bonus that isn't tied to a specific typing. For example, Freena's burst is a universal bonus. Yelan's A4 only buffs the active character, but it's still universal. Certain weapons that just say damage bonus instead of something like skill or burst damage bonus are also considered as universal. And then finally, when I say passive bonuses, it just means any sort of self buff that comes from a character's own talents or constellations. For example, Zhang Li gains a base damage bonus based on his max HP. Yaimiko gains a damage percent bonus based on her EM. Lynette's A4 just lets her burst deal a flat 15% more damage. Things like that all work towards shock value. Here's where things don't work. First of all, because the damage type is only considered as a dot type, it won't benefit from any sort of buffing that's usually tied to a different type. So Emblem's burst damage buff wouldn't work on Shangling, or Golden Troop's skill damage buff doesn't work on Farina. It also can't work with certain character buffs like Sijuin's skill damage bonus or Raiden's burst damage bonus. Additionally, the shock value damage can't crit, so you can say goodbye to that. And since it can't apply elements, it can't trigger a reaction, which means you can't try to boost the damage with Quicken, Vape, or Melt. But this also has a silver lining, that when you slot Kafka into a team, the shock value won't screw with any possible reactions you might want to benefit from. So those are the conditions we have for triggering the effect. The next thing I wanted to convert was the stacking mechanic that some Star Rail dot abilities follow. Here's how I went about that. For every 2 seconds the dot ability's max duration is, it'll stack the damage instance up to a max of 7 times. Bonuses that can extend the ability's max duration can also contribute to the additional stacks. Like how Shangling C4 increases her duration from 10 seconds to 14. It can also work for dynamic extensions. Let's say I cast Kali's Burst and then use Kafka's skill. Initially, Kali would have 3 stacks for her 6 second duration. If you manage to extend the duration with her A4 passive, the new max duration is 9 seconds, which means the next shock value hit is 4 stacks instead of 3. Duration by itself is a pretty easy thing to measure, since most abilities have it listed in their description. There are some special cases we need to talk about. Some dot abilities don't have a duration listed, 
and some aren't even duration based. So if we're looking to include those as well, we have to look at actual tested data and conclude what their quote unquote internal duration would be. For example, in Xiangling's skill description, there isn't actually a duration listed for her Guoba, but other players tested it out and found that it was measured to last around 7 seconds, so it can front load 3 stacks. Then for Kachina's skill, its base duration is around 12 seconds when you're timing it, ergo, 6 stacks for the shock value. I mentioned earlier that Kafka's technical duration is 18 seconds, which means that she can cap out at the 7 stack limit. The next thing I want to cover about this is that there are special ways to further strengthen a character's shock value. For one, Kafka will track each individual source of damage. This means that characters who can deploy multiple sources of dot abilities benefit more from Kafka. Farina is a good example of this. She summons her three pets, which each have their own multiplier scalings. Other characters with this bonus include Shiori, who can summon up to two tomato dolls. Or Yaimiko, who summons three independent turrets. This not only applies to summons, but marks as well. Since Charlotte is a character who applies up to 5 marks onto enemies, she can quintuple her shock value damage in AoE combat. You can also buff the damage based on how multipliers might work. Emily is probably the only example I have of this, but her level 2 lamp has a times 2 added to its multiplier. Even though Emily's dot is a single source, the times 2 bonus still buffs the shock value damage. Also, the damage is still affected by defense and resistance multipliers, so defense reduction or resistance shred will play a factor in damage output. For additional info on her skill, Kafka's initial strike will generate 5 electro particles, making her a good battery for your teammates. As mentioned before, her duration effectively lasts for 18 seconds, and the cooldown will be 20 seconds. Since her actual hit rate is very slow, Kafka effectively applies electro once every 6 seconds meaning she won't be reliable in reaction teams, but it also means she won't mess up existing reaction teams and can be useful as a flex slot. And finally, Kafka's shock value hits have a very small AoE. You're not going to be able to hit enemies who are spread out, but if you can group them next to the enemy who has the Widow Mark, you still have a good chance of hitting multiple foes. So that was a lot of explaining, and I want to show you a replica of an actual scenario. Our Lakino is going to be our Kafka replacement. And let's say a realistic team would be a Taser team with Yai, Farina, and a C6 Sayu. For this example, assume Farina is on her Golden Troop set with her signature weapon, Yai is on Gilded with her signature, and Sayu is on VV. Start off your rotation by setting up your various dot abilities and then switch to Kafka and cast her skill. Alright, and pause right there. Kafka's mark will detect the 3 pets from Farina, the 3 turrets from Yai, and the 1 Daruma from Sayu. The numbers that pop up will show for each individual damage source, so that means 3 Hydro numbers, 3 Electro numbers, and 1 Animo number. On top of that, Kafka's mark is also a dot, so there's one more Electro number. Then, every 6 seconds, the ticks will happen again and re-trigger the shock value for every dot ability still present on the field. And then to give you a specific understanding of the bonuses, Farina's shock value will benefit from her HP multipliers, her Hydro damage bonus, her A4 damage bonus, and her signature HP bonus. It will not benefit from her skill damage bonuses from Golden Troop or her sword. Yai's turret skill off her attack, but will also gain value from her A4's EM bonus, and the elemental damage bonus from her max stack weapon passive. However, if you ran her in Quicken, it wouldn't benefit from the reaction. And then her signature weapon's skill damage bonus also wouldn't work. Finally, Sayu's Daruma scales on her attack, but at C6, her EM will increase the attack multiplier of her burst damage. Whilst on a direct damage scaling, the multiplier being affected is still viable to buff the shock value damage. Then, all of these characters will have the shock value damage buffed by Farina's universal bonus. And then Sayu running VV can shred the hydro and electro damage of those sources as well. If I had the time and energy, I would totally cover every character. But contrary to popular belief, I do still have a life outside of Genshin and YouTube. So hopefully this one scenario will suffice for better context. Since Kafka's A1 passive is related to her skill, let's cover that first. If an enemy is defeated while affected by Widow's Bite, Kafka regenerates 5 energy. Additionally, if an enemy is defeated while affected by Widow's Bite, Kafka will apply a Widow's Bite onto the next enemy to take damage. If Kafka is still in the Night Soul Blessing state while there's no mark on an enemy, the intervals between hits will be paused, and this is just to prevent her mark from being wasted. Since Kafka has a lot of damage potential already, I decided to take from her A4 Traces energy regen. It's a bit weaker, but it allows Kafka to focus less on ER, especially in AoE scenarios where multiple enemies can die. The second part is my own addition and is meant to address multi-wave combat. 
If an enemy is defeated early on, you don't have to wait for Kafka's skill to come back from cooldown. You just start attacking the next enemy and the mark will reapply on them. <sighs> Finally done with her skill. Yeah, all of that was just her skill. Let's cover her burst next, and I promise it'll be a lot more streamlined from now on. Spinning around while raining a barrage of bullets, Kafka deals AoE electro damage, dealing only 72% attack. After that, all enemies will take an instance of shock value damage only for the Widow's Bite, equal to 95% of its original damage. This ability is a very strong way to front load dot damage onto enemies. Her long skill duration grants her the full 7 instances of the front loaded shock value, which would make her total motion value around 1600%. It's going to have a 60 cost burst with a 15 second cooldown, and it'll apply Electro one time. Kafka's A4 passive will match her A2 trace. When she casts her elemental burst, all enemies will now take shock value damage based on every active dot ability instead of just receiving damage from her Widow's Bite. I don't think I need to break it down, but to give you an idea of its potential, in the scenario where you skill and burst at the same time, you effectively deal two instances of the entire team's shock value damage which is incredibly powerful as a front-loaded ability. This damage multiplier will match the one scaling with her burst, which means at level 8, it deals 95% of the original multipliers. So next up, let's explore Kafka's best builds, starting with artifacts. The stats are very simple to follow. Her main damage source is her shock value, which doesn't benefit from crit. So instead of following the classic attack electro damage crit build, you want to go with attack damage attack. For her substats, you should only focus on attack and a bit of ER. Crit and EM is fine, but it'll only buff her regular skill and burst hits, which are a very trivial part of her damage, so you shouldn't be honing in on those stats. Next is artifact sets. For her support sets, Noblesse is a standard attack set which works well in attack scaling teams, but some of Kafka's best teams will actually have alternate scalings. Tenacity is the same way, in which it works but not for every team. Additionally, since Kafka's skill hits every 6 seconds, it loses uptime on Tenacity's 3 second duration. Deepwood is a support set in Dendro teams, but nowhere else. In short, all of these sets will work, but it's not an amazing choice. If you want a really good set for Kafka, the new Cinder City set is going to be an amazing piece for her. Kafka has slower application, and this allows her to reliably be the trigger instead of the applier in reactions. So you can use this set and grant her and her teammates the corresponding 40% elemental damage bonuses. And because elemental damage bonuses will be able to buff shock value, it will be a very good boost for Kafka teams. As I mentioned before, I added the Night Soul Blessing mechanic specifically to address her lack of artifact options. For example, Golden Troop can only buff Kafka's Widow's Bite, but not her shock value. Emblem only affects the one hit of her burst, and once again, not the shock value. That was kind of the hard part about this kit concept. Bringing in a completely new mechanic made it practically unusable with the current gear we have. And honestly, it's a good thing Natlin came around with this because I was struggling to make this viable on basically all of her sets. Kafka's weapons are somewhat limited, as they can only focus on attack and certain damage buffs, as well as not being able to benefit from other stats like EM or crit. Her best free-to-play option includes Finale of the Deep, since it gives a massive amount of attack bonuses. It does require you to have a healer to fully proc the effect. For a weaker option, there's Dark Iron Sword, where you gain an attack bonus after triggering an Electro Reaction. But with its limited availability, you're stuck at either R1 or R2 for its passive. Tokobo Shigure is an okay choice for its 32% damage bonus, but its EM passive is a bit weaker. Black Cliff Slasher can grant her up to 72% attack at R5, but its downsides are that its crit damage subset isn't super good, its passive requires Kafka to be on field when she defeats an enemy, and you'd have to be in multi-wave or AoE combat. For some gacha 4-star options, you could consider Alley Flash. The EM subset is weaker, but it has a high base attack to compensate. And as long as you avoid taking damage, you can get up to 24% damage bonus. Lion's Roar is good for pyro or electro based teams. And finally, Favonia Sword is fine for energy regen, but when Kafka doesn't want to build crit, you might have lower crit rate and harder particle procs. For the best 5 star options, Summit Shaper grants attack, but it requires a shielder. Mist Blur provides a high amount of elemental damage bonuses, which work to buff all of her damage, but you can't get one of the stacks without an infuser. Plus, crit damage subset, not that good. Freedom Sworn isn't a horrible choice. Kafka gets a flat 10% damage bonus, and when she triggers the passive, her team gets 20% attack and then 16% basic attack bonus. You can cast her skill and burst to try triggered 2 reactions in quick succession, granting the passive easily. 
The only real downside is the EM passive being whatever, but I do think it would be her best support weapon. With that out of the way, let's look at her signature light cone, which would be Patient is All You Need. Not a great name for a sword, so let's instead call it Spirit Whisperer, named after her special hypnosis ability. Following my conversion, its base attack is 674. There's no convertible substat, so I'll just make it 33.1% attack bonus, since it's better than crit. Its passive increases all damage by 24 to 48%, which means all of her damage, even her own shock value, gets buffed. If the user hits an enemy that is not affected by erode, they will apply erode for 12 seconds. Enemies affected with erode take an instance of damage every 2 seconds, equal to 60 to 120% of the user's attack. Erode's damage will match the element of the character, but cannot apply an elemental aura. Erode's damage is only considered as dot, and can be applied even if the user is off-field. Erode can only occur on one enemy at a time. This weapon is a very strong one for Kafka, since it can buff her main damage of dot sources. It also grants an additional form of dot damage, which further increases her shock value output. Since this matches her own element, Electro Damage will be able to buff this. The weapon is a pretty general option, so any sort of attack scaling user will make good use of it. Your DPS units who generally have higher attack stats will of course be the better options, but since it's heavily dot focused, it's a perfect fit for Kafka's kit. Next up, I'll just show some damage calculations to give you a general idea of how her damage output would be in a few scenarios. Let's say that for this first scenario, we showcase that I have the same team I used earlier. I'm gonna make it more of a free-to-play friendly option, so we're gonna say that it's gonna be Kafka on a 4P Cinder City set, using attack, electro damage attack, and an R5 finale of the deep. Farina will use a 4 piece Golden Troop on HP HP crit and an R5 Festering Desire. Yai is on Gilded with attack damage crit and an R5 Widsith. I'll take the average of all three bonuses for her final calculation. Finally, C6 Sayu with full EM, a VV set, and an R5 Mailed Flower. Farina's burst will average at 200 fanfare points, which is around 42% damage bonus at level 8, and will take into consideration VV Shred and Cinder City's bonuses for the relevant characters. Realistically, many of the bonuses will start to run out as the rotation goes on, and this calculation is mainly going to measure the earlier procs of shock value. Based on my calculations, Kafka's shock value would proc at around 55,000 damage per hit, and Farina is around the same value. Depending on the buff she gets from Widsith, Yai can deal as low as 69,000 damage to as much as 87,000. On average though, it's around 77,000. Finally, Sayu gets the short end of the stick. Her procs are only around 7600 damage, but while her shock value damage is bad, she's still going to be a valuable support in this team. She's bringing healing, VV shred, and her on-field playstyle can continuously proc electrocharged. Her best damage source is going to be coming from those reactions, not her personal damage. In total, each proc of shock value is around 184,000 damage. There's no mistaking that these are going to be incredibly strong numbers. The next part of calculations I want to do is a quick comparison of Kafka using different weapons. This set will include no external buffs, it's just her damage in a vacuum. We'll just use Cinder City on attack damage attack again for consistency. Starting off with 4 star options, we'll look at Finale of the Deep, Alley Flash, and Lion's Roar. Compared to Finale, Alley Flash is going to be around 12% worse, while Lion's Roar is only around 2% worse. The main conditions are that Finale requires a healer to get the buffs, while Lion's Roar requires you to have a Pyro or Electrocentric team. While Alley Flash is noticeably lower in damage, it's also a really easy universal passive to maintain. Next up, we have comparisons for 5-star options. We're comparing her signature weapon to Summit Shaper, which will include a shielder, and we'll also assume Kafka stays on field to gain the stacks. We'll have Miss Splitter, which is only at 2 stacks since she can gain all 3 on her own. And finally, Freedom Sworn. While her signature is pretty weak on other characters, it maximizes its value on Kafka due to her ability to front load dot abilities. It's like adding a base damage bonus to her initial shock value hits, which actually allows it to stand ahead in the competition. It's around 7% better than Summit Shaper, which is the only real competition. Since Miss Player can't get all 3 stacks and its crit damage subset is less than useful on Kafka, and Freedom Sworn is more of a supportive weapon, so while it will improve Kafka's buffing potential, her personal damage takes a massive dip, being around 32% weaker. The last two weapons are actually on par with 4 star options with Kafka, and this is a side effect of her very unique kit being non-synergistic with many weapons. For my next section, I'm going to cover constellations. When I show comparisons, it'll include Kafka's signature weapon on a Cinder City set. For balancing purposes, I swapped her first two Eidolons. C1 is inspired by her original E2. 
For C1, when Kafka's in the party, dot dealt by allies is increased by 25%. This is effectively just a damage bonus, but remember, when I changed up the mechanics of the game, I made it so that the original abilities would also benefit from dot buffs. For example, while Farina's shock value is considered as only dot, her original skill is considered both skill and dot damage, so even that gets buffed by Kafka C1. Looking at Kafka herself, her damage at C1 is around 10% higher. At C2, shock value will have its stack limit increased by 2. Additionally, while Kafka is in the party, all dot abilities with durations below 15 seconds have their durations increased by 34%. This constellation does two things. One, increasing the stack limit means more damage output on shock value. It can max out at 9, which means abilities with a longer duration will benefit from these stacks. Second, it will increase the duration of existing dot abilities, allowing them to have more stacks. It's limited to abilities of 15 seconds and below to prevent someone like Farina having like 40 second durations. So this increase allows them to have around 4 seconds of uptime, which means 8 stacks instead of 6. Kachin is going to be an interesting case since she technically get the buff as well. Since her drill is based around Night Soul points, we can just say that it'll linger a bit longer even after her points are depleted. The output compared to her base kit is around 36% better, and I would say it's one of her best stopping points. At C3, Kafka's skill level is increased by 3. This not only buffs her cast and widows by damage, but it also increases the multiplier of her skill's shock value. The damage increase compared to C0 is 97% higher, also a good stopping point. At C4, when an enemy takes damage from Widow's Bite, Kafka regenerates 2 energy. Additionally, the range of shock value's AoE is increased. Since Kafka's original E4 was just the energy regen, I added an additional buff to make it a bit more worth investing into. Before, shock value's AoE was practically single target, which required enemies to be hugging for it to work in groups. With this con, the AoE isn't massive, but you can afford to have more gaps in between enemies. I want to say it's now like Kokomi's Jellyfish, but that's a rough estimate. C5 increases her burst level by 3, which increases her actual burst damage, as well as the multiplier of her burst shock value for the team's damage. Shock values coming from the burst now deal 97% more damage, but this doesn't affect her skill shock value. And finally, at C6, after Kafka casts her skill, she gains an Electro Infusion for 10 seconds, which cannot be overridden. Additionally, all damage is increased based on 156% of her attack. When Kafka's Electro Basic attacks hit enemies marked by Widow's Bite, she will instantly trigger shock value damage equal to 95% of the dot ability's original damage. These instances of shock value can occur 5 times per cast of her skill. This is a very powerful constellation as it increases Kafka's personal damage but also her team's shock value damage. It's your classic off-field DPS gets an on-field roll. Because this ability has a lot of damage buffs and calculations, I'm just gonna say the damage increase between her C0 and C6 is one Kafkillian. But because her autos apply Electro relatively fast, you can run her as an on-fielder in Quicken teams, making EM and crit stats slightly more valuable to farm for. And by applying Electro more often, it also means that you can use Thundering Fury as an alternative set instead of Cinder City. Finally, let's cover Kafka's best synergies. This is going to be an interesting section, because it's less focused on the classic archetypes and more around synergies with specific units. Kafka's concept brings a wildly different approach to team building synergy in Genshin. In this game where reactions are king, she somewhat shrugs off that idea. Her electro application being very slow means she can't reliably enable or trigger reactions, but it does mean she won't screw up a lot of existing teams. So in the event you need a flex slot, Kafka would be able to work. One of the best synergies Kafka has is with Farina. You can run these two in a variety of teams, and it'll be an amazing duo. Farina is dot-based combat, and her burst can buff everyone in the party, including the shock value's dot hits. So as long as you run a healer, their full potential is unlocked. Another amazing character would be Chiori. Her multipliers are also pretty high, and unlike Farina, a lot of the damage bonuses she gets from her gear is actually raw geo damage, which means she can hold her own even without external buffs. Additionally, since there can be two cucumbers on the field, this doubles the shock value Chiori has. Another great character is Emily. With a burning team, her multiplier increases to deal extra hits of damage, so it's a very good bonus for Kafka's abilities. Additionally, because Kafka's application is very slow, she won't disrupt burning as much, so you can safely run her as that flex slot. And with that, Xiangling serves as a good secondary DPS for extra dot output, and Bennett can be a good buffer to work as that last slot. I also mentioned in the examples that Yai was a really good choice. Her being able to summon 3 turrets means triple the damage output. On top of her shock value damage, her personal damage is still really good in Quicken teams. Since Kafka's already Electro, you especially don't have to worry about application. 
There are many more characters with dot abilities, but I don't have time to cover them all. This is just a small list of her best synergies, and as time goes on, that list will get expanded upon. Anyway, that's gonna do it for this episode. Since dot mechanics don't exist in Genshin, I had to do a lot of extra stuff to make Kafka's kit work properly. It was pretty hard to get a working system that didn't get too confusing, so I doubt it's a perfect idea, but overall, I like what I did. Anyway, let me know in the comments what you think about Kafka's kit and the custom mechanics I implemented. If you have things you would change or any ideas you want to share, let me know as well. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you all next time. Bye!